Hi, so 20 minutes to explain how to produce a AAA video game. How hard can it be, of course? So just to take a gauge of the room, how many people in the room are game developers? And how many are AAA game developers? OK, so that's good. So it's like what you do, but bigger. Um, there we go. That only took 20 seconds, didn't it? So a bit about me. I've been in the games industry uh, for 25 years now. This is a whole bunch of games um, that I've worked on over that time. Started off with um, thinking that 10 was quite a big uh, game team to work on. And now we're sort of more like 150 in the core team and... I don't know, in the whole team, maybe a thousand, I guess, on a AAA game. Uh, currently work for um, Criterion Electronic Arts Studio. We're based in Guildford in the south of England. Hopefully you know where that is. Um, and uh, Guildford's been around, uh, sorry, Guildford's been around a long time. Criterion's been around about the same amount of time that I've been in the industry. Um, if you can remember right back to some of the first ones on these, then well done. But obviously, um, grew up on the um, Burnout franchise. Um, and was acquired by EA shortly after publishing Electronic. Uh, sorry, sorry, acquired by EA shortly after publishing Burnout 3. And the first uh, game I worked on was actually Black, uh, and then Burnout Revenge for 360. Um, and more recently, we've been working um, with some of our amazing partners within the EA Studio family on these massive games. So. These games have become so big that in many cases we have multiple EA studios um, working on them. And um, about seven years ago we had a leadership change. Uh, Matt Webster, who's sitting at the front here, became GM. Um, and uh, we really decided to redefine how we were going to work. We started from a really simple idea of why isn't it fun to make fun. We make fun for a living and we realised that we were miserable a lot of the time. So we set out to fundamentally change the way we made video games that was absolutely um, talent-focused. We think that um, the way to make great video games is with great teams, and you should start from a talent-focused point of view. If you have a product-focused point, point of view, I think you can have success, but I don't believe it's sustainable um, over the long term or scalable either. Um, I think you're going to find it only goes wide as the leadership you have. So along the way, we're very proud to say that um, in the three years since gamesindustry.biz have been running these Best Place to Work awards, um, we've been a winner um, every year. Um, that's something we're very proud of achieving. So when we start, set out to think about our process, um, we would naturally think of it as something which was grounded fully in the philosophy and values that we've established over this sort of seven-year cycle that we've been in most recently. So our vision for our process at Criterion is that it's continuously improving process. So necessarily what I'm going to share with you today is a snapshot, and it's something that we're trying to improve all the time, that integrates project management, product management, and game direction. And I'll explain my definition of the difference between those three, and something that handles uh, scaling people, technology, and practice, because all of those are getting bigger and wider all the time, and is grounded firmly in criterion philosophy and values. What is Criterion's philosophy and values then that we are grounded in? So our philosophy around people and process is based on these two key ideas. When we think, think about process at Criterion, then our razor is no dogma. Dogma being something that's accepted uh, uh, as fact without standing up to challenge. If it does stand up to challenge, it becomes a fact and no longer dogma. And um, when we think about our approach to people, um, is to treat people as talent, not as resources. Resources is something like oil that you get out of the ground. Um, people are talent, and that's what drives our video games. So to break that down a little for you, what do we mean by uh, no dogma? So people-driven process. Process exists to serve people, not the other way around. Uh, within parameters, favour autonomy. So uh, I like to say that's over team task and technique. So within the well-aligned priorities of the studio, mainly our budget and um, our game priorities. We try to maximise the autonomy our talent has over who they work with, what they work on and how they work on it. And Goldilocks goals for mastery. So that's that sweet spot between, uh, if you imagine an RAF symbol, the middle circle being um, what I know I can't do and the outside circle, sorry, the inside circle being what I know I can do, the outside circle being what I know I can't do. The mastery zone is the sweet spot, the Goldilocks spot, in between those two things, because we know that maximises motivation and engagement. 
and to treat people as talent. So presume passion. Passion for the game you're making and passion for your craft. That's assumed. I'm not asking anyone at Criterion to prove that to us. Um, to build a team, know a team. So that's, um, <clears throat> we charge all our managers to get to know their talent from the intrinsic motivation upwards. So not just uh, um, why do you want to make this game, but why do you want to make a game at all? And increasingly we find, particularly as we're trying to attract um, Gen Z talent, why do you want a job at all when you could just be running your own YouTube channel? That's the level we believe we need to understand our talent at. And um, probably most significantly is we've fundamentally decided to change our leadership style seven years ago, to completely abandon a command and control approach uh, and embrace and influence and inspire. And so we wanted, we defined our values in terms of um, behaviour rather than single words that end up on a t-shirt or a coaster that no one looks at. Um, behaviour is something we think can actually be measured and we can guide ourselves by. So our number one uh, value is that we love games and we love making games. Um, so we want a criterion process that is in service to a healthy studio that's consistently uh, shipping high quality successful games that are our games, not anyone else's, they're the ones we want to make. We place enormous value on creative energetic collaboration. So we want a process that gives everyone the same context of where we are and where we're going. Responsibly open, transparent and generous. Um, so we want a process that supports data informed and not data driven decision making and is visible to all. So um, it's great to be, uh, have access to data, but um, data will tell you what works in the general case, but you still need human judgment to work out what, what works in this specific case for you. Um, so resist dogma and embrace disruptive thinking. So we want to build on legit best practice, um, but we want to um, personalize it and continuously improve. Uh, and this one, we always presume positive intent and encourage curiosity to challenge convention in people, uh, product and process. So we want to learn from what happened and not who happened. So um, everything we learn about our development is to make that process better, not to um, as part of the appraisal process for any individual on our team. So that's our aspiration. And um, so to deliver on that autonomy, what we need is uh, to push context down into the team so decisions can be made as close to the point of execution as possible. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of context that we need to share with our team um, for that to be possible. And it relies on these three things that I mentioned right at the start. So the game direction that provides the inspiration and the actual individual crafts direction of the game. Then there's the product management. So we, div we break that definition of what we're trying to achieve down um, into um, a taxonomy so that we can arrive with um, briefs for people that they can exercise their autonomy against. And then project management, which is the process which is largely involves prioritization and sequencing of that work uh, and avoids um, conflict between individual teams. All those three things together means that our talent knows what to achieve next and has enough context um, to practice their autonomy over um, decision making. So. We said we're built on legit best practices. What approaches do we have to help? So um, I would imagine everyone here takes some form of agile approach. Does everyone take some form of agile approach? Yes. OK, so that sort of splits into agile is uh, development philosophy. Um, but it's not really uh, what I would call a methodology. It's more of a um, philosophy of how you might develop things. Scrum is a particular flavor of agile. It's the one that um, we choose. Um, and it gives us some rituals and some practices that are very useful. And then to scale, we have um, the Scaled Agile Framework for Enterprise, which is a framework to layer over that Scrum that allows it to work um, at the wider scale. And I'll talk about our take on that um, momentarily. So I just want to talk, I've said that we're all about Agile, but I do want to talk about Waterfall, because I think Waterfall actually gets... Um, a really bad rep, like um, it's like really uncool or you're doing something wrong if you use waterfall. There's plenty of waterfall within modern game development. Almost certainly mass asset production is going to be waterfall. Um, but it's about choosing the right process for the right problem. So to me, it's about what can be fixed and what can be estimated. And certainly um, where scope can be fixed, then waterfall is a really um, good approach to take. Um, but feature development, it's more likely um, that scope is the thing that varies 
um, and that your team and time, I think, certainly by the time you've committed to a ship date, that's going to be true. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about, first, about how we take Agile into our process, and then I'll talk about how we um, scale that to a wider team. So um, the thing I would say is, for us, it's not about just taking Agile um, as you would get taught it on a commercial course and applying it directly to the game process. It's about applying the roles within it and the rituals within it to something that works um, really well for us. So this is what Agile would tell you the product owner role needs to do. It's one person who knows what to build, what not to build, what to deliver next, can judge value um, both um, to the customer and knowledge creation value simply by consulting with all the stakeholders who are happily co-located with you. Um, and they can judge that against risk, which can divide down into business, social tech, cost and schedule. And they can do realistic expectation management, analysing team throughput, and give a ranged answer to a whole bunch of really difficult questions about what you can achieve. I don't believe anyone can do that, um, even for uh, a fairly small video game, let alone a massive AAA uh, approach. So that needs to break down into multiple Role. So how do we do that within game dev? So players' needs and creative ideas, that's um, a collaboration between our producers and our designers and our craft directors. All of those people need to consult widely um, with the wider team as well. Judging value to the player and value to us, um, to what we learn from what we're making. Um, so player value, that's um, on our producers and our designers. And our knowledge value is on uh, craft directors. In terms of judging risk, the f I like this breakdown of the four different types of risks. Um, but again, that's going to break down through multiple roles within the team as well. Um, so our business risk is largely sits with our business leaders or our general managers and our executive producers. Social risk is our development directors, which I think is kind of an EA-specific role. You can think of them as our sort of professional process coaches and project managers. Um, and our producers. Tech and content risk comes from the craft directors and the wider team, and cost and schedule risk, again, that DD and producer partnership. So partnerships are really important all the way through. And finally, that realistic expectation management is from the DDs working very closely uh, with the craft directors. So um, the PO role then actually is largely between three different roles, our producer role, um, who stands for the product truth. They hold that product truth for the whole game or their area, depending on how it's scaled. Um, the lead of any given area, which is someone within that craft, who stands for uh, the vision of the given area or the whole game, and the DD who stands for the development reality. So to deliver Agile's PO role, we believe we need all three of those roles to work very closely um, together. And constantly, making video games is all about trade-offs, right? So in an ideal world, we'd be in the sweet spot between building the right thing, building it smart, and building the thing right. Because if we neglect one of those, like in this place, where we neglect building the thing right, our velocity will eventually slow to zero. Um, if we're here, where we're neglecting building it smart, we'll end up having to slip our date or reduce our scope. Uh, and if we're here where we're rejecting building the right thing, then in game development, we're just uh, entertaining ourselves and there's not really a lot of scope for that in our industry anymore. Um, so that's great. That's how we do Agile. Um, how do we apply that to scale? So as I said, um, we just use the scaled Agile framework. So just go on the internet, get that down, and start using that. It would be a total... Nightmare. So this is something that's created for large enterprises to run um, large, um, you know, commercial software, um, and it doesn't apply directly um, to video games. But many of the roles uh, and the rituals do, and um, these are the parts that we find to be most useful from it. So our product management. So in organising. Uh, what we're building and giving that um, a taxonomy that gives it scale that allows us to manage at multiple levels. Um, SAFE is really um, powerful, I believe, for introducing the concept of sagas, themes and epics. So the definition and boundaries of a pillar um, the, uh, of the experiences, so breaking it down into the major experiences within the video game, that's our sagas. The sagas then can um, be broken down into themes. 
So they define uh, the boundaries and the many pieces that then make up that saga. Um, and those are Moscow rated. So Moscow stands for um, must, should, could, and um, won't. Uh, not want, as Matt would have it. Um, and then the epics, which become um, like our milestone goals, they describe the detail of those themes, and I'll show how they mix in. So from where we were before, you can think of themes as sort of your big feature list and your feature areas grouped up, and um, epics as what you would typically have as milestone goals. But um, having them all contained with a layer above allows a way to manage um, the scope of a AAA game. Then for project management, like I said, those epics um, are the context for um, breaking the whole game you're trying to build down into individual milestones that you can build over, well, we take a six-week cycle, but whatever you want to do, four weeks is often common in the industry as well. So the epic, um, I've got that description as a theme. They can be taken by a team broken down into stories, which is simply a chunk of work that you can tell whether it's done or not something measurable, and if you want, you can break those down into um, subtasks, so something in the granularity of about uh, a day or so as well. Um, so it's really powerful for that. So the safe roles in the game context. So in safe, all these roles would be presumed. If you went and got that um, scary diagram that I showed off of the internet, these are some of the, the roles that it would tell you you need. Stakeholders, in our case, proxies for the player. They would say proxies for the customer. They measure outcome by reviewing software. Uh, product manager manages and prioritizes themes into releases. They would also tell you about a chief product owner and product owners who have roles, and that's how the hierarchy would work in SAFE. Um, in our context, in a video game, um, instead of just having those stakeholders, you're actually going to need um, business leadership. It'll either be local in our case, or it would be a publisher if you're a third-party developer. And they have multiple roles. They are proxies for the player. They do measure outcome. Um, but they're also proxies for the um, uh, business. And they're also going to give play feedback on player value that they judge. And of course, they're going to provide suggestions for new features. Then you have a game direction layer. It manages and prioritizes themes in backlogs, in the backlog into releases. Um, and then the game producer team would um, take those and um, create epics based on those themes and lead uh, our producers or product owners um, to prioritize those so that um, the dev teams finally get to actually do the work. And these can be managed at multiple levels. With our dev directors, remember there are professional process coaches and project managers um, can help that whole process work. Nearly there. How does it all fit together? Um, really simply, actually, just in this simplified game loop. So at the heart, what we're trying to do via a process of collaboration and communication um, is uh, give our teams all of that context that I talked about in that three-circle diagram so that they can make the decisions on what they do. Um, so it starts with our stakeholders who stand there for our players, our brands, and for our business. They work closely um, with our business leadership, who are the proxies for them, um, who give our game direction um, release goals and product goals so that they can come up with um, parts of the product that can be um, grouped into the next release, or they can reject it, either not for this lease, release or not for this game. Um, so there would be a whole bunch of sagas and themes prioritized by value by that direction leadership team. They'll all head into uh, the game backlog so that the production leadership team um, can make decisions about what heads into uh, the next milestone. Um, so obviously not everything can go in the next milestone, and what doesn't um, remains in the backlog. Um, and then the stuff that they do choose for the milestone is passed to our dev teams. And our dev teams are um, characterized by being three different types of teams. So there's the core feature teams who are building the experiences. But there's also supply teams who are doing things like uh, building world. But they might also be core tech teams in there as well. And through those are your interface into probably that waterfall um, part of the game that I talked about earlier. So your mass asset production comes in through your supply teams. And then you have service teams who are fundamentally dependent on the feature team. So think of things like uh, user interface and um, maybe VFX and lighting in there. 
they produce, uh, they actually do a bunch of work finally, um, and there's output, and all of that output then goes back into a review process um, so that we can go around at the next uh, uh, level of iteration for another release, and another set of milestones, and another set of sprints. And um, all of that is managed um, by a whole bunch of rituals, again, which are um, explained within the whole safe and um, agile methodologies and are learnable, um, but I'm certainly not going to cover all of those in there. I've color coded though, them by the team that would drive them. So simply by um, combining all of those um, together, we have a way of delivering on those values that pushes context as close to um, the point of decision making as possible um, and allows our um, talented developers to maximize their autonomy, grow their mastery, and be united by um, a common purpose. So I'm sure you've got that, and that was all easy. That was actually 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to stand outside up in the lobby upstairs. People want to um, ask me questions or connect me with me via these methods or um, LinkedIn. Um, I'd be happy uh, to connect with all of you. Thanks very much for your attention.